Good morning, or depending on when you're listening to this, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. My name's Ross, and I was always told I had a voice for radio, so I've made a podcast all about the Pokemon trading card game. And you're listening to BTCG Radio. Now, the first thing to mention this week is, unfortunately, that my technical problems, I shan't bore you with details, they are still ongoing. I am aware that the last couple of weeks haven't gone up on iTunes. I am hoping that by the time you listen to this, that will have been fixed. But if you know of anyone who usually gets it on iTunes and hasn't been getting it recently, and I've had, shall we say, a few people come to me with that problem, please do direct them to SoundCloud. I've also had a chat with Pokemon Dan, and hopefully the ones that haven't been going up on his channel will be going up very, very shortly indeed. The sound clips in terms of the one from my lovely friend Derek that go at the end, and from the wonderful Nick McCord, the announcer from Pokemon Worlds, which goes at the beginning, hopefully we'll be making a comeback next week, but unfortunately with my laptop dying I've got to go and cut them from a previous podcast. All very boring. But I assure you the technical problems are being worked out and should be fixed fairly soon. So moving on to news this week, it, it's been a fairly short week for news to be perfectly honest with you. It's not been a huge amount going on, but there's been a little bit and because I'm a generous man, I'm going to share what I've got for you. First of all, we have had it confirmed that the pre-release promo for Plasma Storm is going to be the Crobat. Now this is a quite interesting one that poisons, and of course with the Verbank City Gym coming out, this poison will be doing something like 60 between turns, as well as I think 40 for the attack on its own, and it's got that ability, which we've seen a few times, which allows you to draw an extra card per turn and does stack. So Crobat, quite frankly, could be seeing a fair bit of play, and it's always nice that we have these pre-release promos that could see a little bit of play. We had Flygon for Boundaries Crossed, and although that hasn't seen a huge amount of play, it's still an interesting playable card. We had Alteria for Dragons Exalted, which did see a fair bit of play, at least early on. So it's nice that we're seeing these pre-release promos that can actually be quite useful. And as it's become customary, it's got alternate art. For those of you wondering, it was released in Japan as a booster box promo, i.e. it was a promo you got for buying a booster box. So we're getting it as our pre-release, and it, it's pretty funky, quite frankly. I'm, I'm happy about this, and I think you should be too. The second bit of news I've got is there's the, um, the new trainer box I mentioned a few weeks ago. This is a box in which you get 7 booster packs, 40 energy cards, a box to keep it all in, some acrylic condition markers, 6 damage counter dice, 1 flipping die, a deck box, and a player's guide. And I was musing at the time that a price of around £30 would make this really, really good, but if it went up to about £40 it would be terrible. Now there is one website, which I'm a fan of and I buy from quite often, but until they sponsor me, I'm not giving any shops free promotion, at least in terms of selling shops, because that would be quite rude. However, they have listed this for £25. Now, the same website, were you to buy seven booster packs, and you'd have to buy five in one lot and then two singles, that would cost you £19. So essentially, on this website, you're paying £6 for 40 energy cards, and the collector's box, and the deck box, and the condition markers, and the damage counter dice, and the flipping die, and the player's guide. This is awesome, and I would heartily, heartily recommend all of you listening to seek out a copy of this and go and buy one. It's due for release in February. I'm not entirely sure if this is the same day as Plasma Storm, but regardless, you should go and get yourself one of these. And the last bit of news, and this is a little bit of promotion, but it's not um, an online selling shop, it's just a card shop where I think you should go along and play. I keep telling you about Aldershot events because they're fantastic. Aldershot Cities is coming up on Sunday the 10th of February. This is actually the day after Nottingham Cities. Now Nottingham Cities is likely to fill up. Nottingham tends to. So get yourself down to Chimera Games C-H-I-M-E-R-A in Nottingham or find them on Facebook, Google them, etc. Get yourself booked into that. Don't just turn up on the day because people have done that before and gotten unlucky. Go there on the Saturday and then on the Sunday, pop yourself down to Aldershot Cities. Now, I have made a habit of telling you when Aldershot have events, and the reason is it's a brilliant place to play. It's run by a lovely man called Martin Gormal, who's a big fan of the podcast, or at least so he tells me, and who am I not to believe him? And there's always a really good lot of players that go down. It's always competitive. It's always fun. Always a brilliant atmosphere. 
except when I dumped that guy at regionals after not letting him bench a second Pokemon after the coin flip. But other than that, it's always a brilliant atmosphere. Lovely place to play. Chances are I will be down there, and I would heartily encourage you to go down as well. It's Sunday the 10th of February. Google the game shop or, or just order shop Pokemon. A-L-D-E-R-S-H-O-T. Order shop Pokemon. And that's the news for this week. Now, this past week, I made my way down to Sheffield City. Now, I, I felt a little bit mean on Saturday, because I realised I'm always giving shout-outs to Sutton, Coldfield, Nottingham and Aldershot as my favourite places to play in the UK. But actually, I go to Sheffield every time they have an event, and I've actually had a lot of success there in recent times. I managed a top two at a Battle Rose playing a ridiculous CPST list with four supporters, multiple Smeargles, and running a ridiculous line of attackers like Zekrom, Zekrom EX, Terrakian, Tornadus, Mewtwo, etc. I also got second there playing a Ho-Oh list focusing on Kyurem and Basculin, which as I mentioned at the time was not the most clever idea. So I popped down to Sheffield City on Saturday. There were 33 Masters, and there were going to be five rounds and a top four. Now, a top four may seem low. I believe they would have been entitled to do a top eight. But as far as I'm aware, they also had the choice, and they chose to do a top four. Now, what this meant was that the most likely scenario would be five four ones and a five zero. That meant that two people who went four ones were going to miss out on that top four. However, because there were over 32 Masters, the kicker came into play, and top 8 were to get 20 points. So that would mean two free 2s would get 20 points. Now certainly you couldn't rely on this, you would need very high resistance to be one of those free 2s, because there were likely to be a fair few free 2s. But it meant you could get lucky and get 20 points as a free 2. Now, for this tournament, I was tempted to play the Ho-Oh list I'd been playing for the last few tournaments, with the one which is just Mewtwo, Tornadus, Terrakian. With Ho-Oh in there is a bit of energy acceleration. But there were a lot of people playing Ho-Oh at the last couple tournaments. Blastoise was seeing more and more play, and is not a nice matchup. And to be fair, I was a little bit bored. So what I'd started playing around with in the week preceding this was Empoleon. Now, I knew my Empoleon Terrakian list wasn't good enough. There were two huge problems with it. Firstly, it didn't really do anything turn one, except for maybe using a Molga. And the more I tested, the more I really didn't like a Molga. Secondly, if somebody were to rush you and start taking apart your setup, you couldn't really do anything in one turn. Empoleon was a stage two that you had to evolve to. Terrakian took two energy. And running fighting and water energy, you couldn't really put Mewtwo in. I'd experimented with Mew, but Mew didn't really do anything unless you had an Empoleon out. And even then, it was too easy to play around. So I started off with Empoleon Mewtwo, and I didn't really like it. Mew Empoleon has its weaknesses, and Mewtwo, you just end up in a Mewtwo war. So then I started playing around a little bit more, and I ended up with a list which was Empoleon Tornadus, with just a couple of Mewtwo thrown in for good measure. Focusing on trying to get the turn one Tornadus. So I played lots of stadiums, a mix of Tropical Beach and Skyro Bridge. I played a full four Tornadus. Skylar and computer search and all that to try and get the DCE on turn one. And I could add a couple of Mewtwo's. I also threw in a 1 1 Rosa Raid line for a little bit of extra um, consistency. And seeing that I was running four level ball as I'd taken out a Molga, I thought that it wouldn't be too difficult to get this Rosa Raid out. And as much as my opponents may try and pick off and snipe that Roselia, if they're picking off the Roselia, they're not killing my Pit Plops and I'm getting Empoleons out, which gives me draw power with Diving Draw, meaning I'm not less likely to, lead, to need this Rosa Raid. So overall, I, I quite liked this idea. I liked the list. It wasn't a perfect list by any stretch of the imagination. I couldn't fit in plus power like I wanted to. But I was happy enough with what I'd managed to come out with. What I liked about this list was it did something turn one. Usually, you'd be able to get a Tornadus, but if you couldn't, you could drop down a Tropical Beach, give yourself a little bit of draw power. I also liked it that they couldn't do what they often did against Empoleon lists, in that they just capture and kill your Piplups. Because if I've got a Tornadus hitting for 100 damage, yeah, they can capture and kill my Piplups, but I'm two hitting any EXs and one hitting a lot of non-EXs. So if they're taking out my Empoleons, I'm still taking prizes. I like this. 
I figured it would have a decent shot against Blastoise, either at donking the Squirtle or at applying early pressure and getting in a two-hit KO wall. Not to mention that one of the things that makes Caldeo Blastoise quite so good, as I've mentioned in the past, is its ability to use things like Max Potion and Super Scoop Up. But with Empoleon attacking for only one energy, I can use Max Potion more efficiently than they can. I liked the Ho-Oh matchup. I liked the straight Darkrai matchup, or the Darkrai Hammers matchup, because none of my attackers need more than one energy attachment. What I didn't like was a Hydreigon matchup, because if they get set up, I can't one hit anything but Sableye, and I'm going to lose. However, in theory, I'm putting on early pressure more than they are, so I've got a decent chance. So I'm feeling a little bit nervous. I actually, I had the feeling in this tournament I haven't had for ages. I had nervous excitement. I've been to a lot of tournaments over the last couple of years and I've kind of got used to playing. But because I was playing a list that I really wanted to play, a deck that, in all honesty, I didn't actually think was all that good, I had that nervous excitement of maybe I'll actually do well with an Empoleon list. So I started off on round one. I'm drawn against Pokemon Dan. He who has only failed to top cut one tournament this season, who's had a ridiculous ridiculous run of success and as we all know is a very good player but I managed to go first I get a turn one tornadoes and I start applying a lot of early pressure now he was playing a dark cry list with Bouffalant, with Mewtwo etc but I had answers for a lot of his stuff he found it very difficult to KO my Empoleons he couldn't one hit them and he had to bring out a variety of tackers to deal with both the Empoleons and the Mewtwo, and that meant my Empoleons were hitting for a fairly decent amount of damage. He started Terrakion, which was bad, and it meant I got a nice early KO without breaking a sweat. And when he brought out his Bouffalon, it was only really good against my Mewtwo. Now, I did start piling energy on a Mewtwo at one point. I got four energy on. Started really doing a lot of damage to the only Darkrai he'd been able to manage to power up. But he then dropped a Mewtwo, which I didn't think that he played. He then dropped a second Mewtwo, really putting down the challenge of don't get into a Mewtwo war with me. However, Empoleon is very, very good against Mewtwo. And I was running Max Potion to stop him doing too much damage. And... In the end, it came down quite nicely. At one point, I made a huge mistake putting a third energy on Mewtwo to KO his Bouffalant, when all that did was allow him to KO my Mewtwo with his. I was holding a Max Potion at the time. I could have retreated, Max Potioned, and just attacked with Empoleon, and I should have done. I wouldn't have got the one-hit KO, but I'd have got the KO more quickly than he would. As it came down, the early pressure I'd put on with Mewtwo, Tornado, and Empoleon was a little bit too much, and I was able to eke out a win in the end. Round two, I'm drawn against Duncan playing Blastoise. Now, there were, I believe, about five people playing Blastoise, and I wanted to avoid them. I figured I could get the win, but I didn't know it. Needless to say, he starts Lone Squirtle. Needless to say, I go second. I may have had the donk, but it's irrelevant. He starts off quite well, he puts a Tropical Beach down turn 1, gets a double Squirtle, and starts setting up. On my turn, I get the Tornadus, I get the DCE, but I cannot get a Stadium. Frustrated at not having a Stadium in order to get the KO on the Squirtle, I figure there's no point attacking for 30, it's going to be useless, I'll use his Tropical Beach to draw some cards. You may have noticed the mistake here, in that I couldn't get a Stadium out to attack, so I used his Tropical Beach. Yeah, realise that halfway through his turn. It did, however, draw me three useless cards and then a supporter. I had a fairly dead hand, so my mistake actually ended up quite well. Now, he used Pokemon Center in his list. Uh, so what he would do, he put out a bunch of Pokemon. My Empoleons were hitting for 110. He'd then retreat his Caldeo to the bench, start using Pokemon Center. I was fine with this. I half killed two Caldeos. I allowed him to retreat them, or, you know, rush in them to the bench, and I allowed him to use Pokemon Center to try and heal them. And I let him heal them just enough, and then I would check down a counter stadium. And it basically left me with two easy KOs on his Caldeos. That got me four prizes, at which point he had to start using his Mewtwo, because he couldn't get Caldeos running enough, and even if he did, my Empoleons were two hitting them. 
he dropped down a Mewtwo with two energy to do 60 to me. He then made what I would consider to be a fairly large mistake, put down a third energy on his Mewtwo and got the KO on my Empoleon. Now, he had at this point taken out all my Empoleons, but I was able to just stick down a Mewtwo DCE and get the win. Round three. I was drawn against a lovely lady called Laura, who was sitting at 2-0, seemed quite excited. It was her first ever tournament and she was sitting at 2-0. What made it even more brilliant, her wins were against Tommy Roberts, the championship point leader from last year in the world, who'd gone to Worlds, and Tamal Cameron, who had been to Worlds. Two good friends of mine who played at Worlds last year, beaten by someone in their first ever tournament. I was chuffed for her. Unfortunately, I went off a little bit crazy in this game. I went first, turn two, I got two Empoleons and a Roserade. Turn three, I had three Empoleons out. Now, I was unable to get a KO on a Dino turn one, but on my second turn, she had one Dino out, I captured and killed it. On my third turn, she had one Dino out, I captured and killed it. Now, the one piece of bad luck I had in this game was that I had two catchers prized, which made the game fairly annoying. However, she left a Sableye up at one point because she needed to get some resources back. I killed that. And on my third prize, I managed to draw a catcher. And I used my third catcher to catcher and kill a Dino. Now, at this point, I've taken four prizes. I've got one catcher left. She can have a Hydreigon. Because there's no point me catching and killing a Dino, running out of catchers, and then she doesn't need the Hydreigon. She can free retreat and max potion and use Dark Patch and all to get um, Darkrai up and running. So at this point, I know I'm killing a Darkrai. I have kill a Darkrai. She's got Adino on the bench. At this point, I've got my final catcher, and I know that unless she gets Rare Candy, Hydreigon, Max Potion, I'm going to win the next turn. Even if she does, I forced her to play fast. I forced her to try and set up a Hydreigon as fast as she can. She's wasted a lot of resources, and the likelihood is she's going to deck out before she takes six prizes. As it turns out, she's not able to get the Rare Candy, Hydreigon. And I'm able to catch her and kill that Darkrai for the win. We did have a friendly game after the tournament. And it was a much, much closer game. But I did manage to pull off the win in the end by KOing one of her Mewtwo. Round four, I'm drawn against my good friend Johnny Hall. The good news is, in this game, there was no end shenanigans resulting in a double game loss. The bad news is, he went first. At the end of his second turn, he had a Blastoise, a Caldea with free energy, a Caldea with one energy, and a Tropical Beach out. At the end of my first turn, I had a Tornadus DCE, nothing else. I couldn't catch up with his amazing start, and he ran through me incredibly quickly. I did try dropping an N and a Mewtwo when he was down to two prizes. Needless to say, he grabbed a supporter and got the KO shortly afterwards. I'm not going to lie, this game wasn't close. Now, I'd had a quick gander, and it turned out that my resistance at this point was crazy good. All of my opponents looked like they were going to finish with positive records, and I knew that my resistance was so good that barring all of my previous opponents losing, I was going to get into top four if I won round five. However, it was also looking very, very likely that even if I lost round five, I was going to be one of the two free twos that was able to actually sneak into top eight and get points on resistance. My round five opponent, John O'Cowley. We've played twice this season. Both times I've gone first and been incredibly lucky while he's had slow starts. This time, I go second. His start isn't great though. I managed to stop him getting a Hydreigon for a very long time and again I'm not wasting my final catcher. We go round and eventually it comes down to this. He's got a half dead Darkrai. He needs Rare Candy, Hydreigon, Max Potion or I can catch her and kill the next turn for the win. He gets a Rare Candy Hydreigon. He doesn't get the Max Potion. Now, I've had to let him get out the Hydreigon, or else I'm stuck in that awkward situation of used all four catchers, only taken five prizes, and he can draw the game out and win. Now, I needed a Water Energy here. I had a nice field. I had three Empoleons out. I had everything I needed. I had the catcher in hand. His Darkrai was easily within range. I just needed a Water Energy. So I draw. It's not a Water Energy. So I Diving Draw, no Water Energy. So I Diving Draw again, no Water Energy. So I Diving Draw for the third time, having drawn seven cards out of my deck, and more than one in seven cards 
in my deck were water energy. Statistically, I should have found one. Needless to say, I didn't. The only supporter I found was a Skylar, and having used my computer search and not playing energy search, there was no way I could convert that Skylar into a water energy. I played the Skylar just to have a quick look, and lo and behold, my next card was a water energy. There's nothing I can do, and the next turn he gets the max potion, sets up, and I can't take another prize. It's incredibly frustrating, but what can you do? I ended up finishing 3-2 with an opponent's win percentage of 72%. Three of my opponents had gone 4-1, the other two had gone 3-2. I've gone back through many previous tournaments, because I tend to take pictures of standings. I literally haven't found anyone who's had an opponent's win percentage that high. The good news is this did put me at 7th place. I did make top 8 and get 20 points. I set myself the target of, with my best finish limit of 4 cities, of getting 110 points. I've currently got 50 from 2 top cuts. That means two more top fours, 60 points, I will have met my target, and I've still got five cities to go. For those that are interested, I am planning on attending Aberdare, Crawley, Nottingham, Aldershot, and possibly Manchester, although its proximity to Valentine's Day does make things fairly awkward. So, all in all, for myself, a decent tournament. I wasn't really that upset at not top cutting. 20 points will do for me. What was annoying was I really wanted to top cut with Empoleon. It wasn't the extra 10 points. It wasn't the packs. It wasn't even the trophy. I wanted to be in top cut with my silly Empoleon list. I very almost made it. The game against Johnny, I was always going to lose. But my last game against Jono, so close. What can you do? The top four was comprised of Charles Barton, Johnny Hall, George Boone, all familiar names, and Duncan Sugru, an unfamiliar name. That hasn't been to many tournaments, but he did win Blackpool Battle Roads. What's interesting, they were all playing Blastoise. I have not been to a tournament where all the top four were playing the same deck since the days of Luxchomp. Now, in the end, Charles Barton and Duncan Sugru made the final, and Duncan Sugru actually won. Which gave my ego a little bit of a stroke, because it meant that Duncan Sugru went through the whole tournament with only one loss, and that was to myself in round two. Now, looking at their Blastoise lists, there were some differences. Johnny Hall went for straight consistency with Max Potion. George Boone played Bouflant to try and take things down like um, Mewtwo and Tornadus. Charles Barton played the Dragon's Vault Kyurem as a Hydreigon counter, and he also played a couple of Psychic Energy, which could also be used with Mewtwo. And the other thing to note here, although this should be obvious, all four of these Blastoise that made Top Cut, they all play Tropical Beach. You have to play Tropical Beach. If you don't, you aren't going to have a good enough Blastoise list. Now, I am only aware of five people playing Blastoise at this particular tournament. Four of them made Top Cut, and I don't believe the other one played Tropical Beach. This is really showing what I've been saying for a couple of weeks now. Blastoise is the best deck in the format. What makes it especially good, it doesn't have any natural counters. It's not like when Luxchomp was dominating and you could play Machamp, or as I chose to do, Donphan. I ended up cutting Nationals in 2011 purely because I played an anti-SP deck and I played against a lot of SP decks. And that got me in purely on deck choice to be honest with you but it's one of those decks that doesn't really have a natural counter now I've put the call out and a name that may be familiar to some of you Jack Stewart Armstead, I had a good chat of him the other day he contends that Hydreigon can beat Blastoise now there were several Hydreigon at this tournament, none of which made top cut and Jack's feeling on it was you need the right list, you need the right player, you need to play the matchup properly. He contends that Hydreigon beats Blastoise, and to be honest, I'm inclined to believe him because he's almost always right. Sigalith can be good against Caldeo, although if they go off too fast, chances are they are going to be able to beat you with Blastoise or something like that. Shame in the X can help, but it's a terrible starter and it's easily killed. The deck is still donkable, so maybe working on a really fast list to try and rush them. What I would say about that, both the games I had against Blastoise in this particular tournament, they got a turn 2 Blastoise. 
pretty much the only testing I did with my Imponial list was against George Boone. I played three games against his Blastoise list. In all three of them, he got a turn two Blastoise. Humorously, when Charles and Johnny played their first game in their top four match, they managed the whole game without either of them actually getting out of Blastoise. But it does seem to be that the list people are running are so consistent, you should expect the turn to Blastoise. And unless they've got a lone Squirtle out, it's gotten to the point now you shouldn't even bother going after the Squirtle. To hit the Caldeos, it's a better use of your time. What is strange is that we don't have a Virizion EX yet. We've seen Terrakion EX. We've seen Cabalion EX. Or at least we will see in Plasma Storm. Still no Virizion, even in Japan, so we've not got one coming anytime soon. Now, there's been a little bit of a trend recently of bringing out EXs of these legendaries, the more recent legendaries as it tends to happen, the Genies and the Musketeers, where they've got an attack that does 30 for 1 energy, and then a bigger attack. So you see Landorus that does 30 and 30 to 1 on the bench for a fighting energy, and then it's got its big attack. Gabalion's coming out in this coming set, which for a, a metal energy does 30 and discards a special energy. Or you've got Thunderous, which is coming out in the near future, which for a lightning energy does 30 and allows you to attach an energy from the discard to one of your Pokemon. Why can we not have a Verizion like this? A Verizion that did 30 for one grass energy would be able to take out Squirtles very nicely, and it would provide a nice counter to a deck that, quite frankly, doesn't have enough good counters. Give it a water resistance as well, we would have a really nice counter. I want Verizion EX. I want it to do 30 and something else for a grass energy, maybe reducing the amount of damage it takes next turn, which would be in keeping with recent grass Pokemon, and then maybe 90 for 3 or 4 energy, something like that. I want that card. It's not going to come soon enough, because they haven't even printed it in Japan, but I would like it. Now, what could potentially help? Plasma Frigate's coming out in the next set. You attach a Plasma Energy to one of your Pokémon, stick down Plasma Frigate, and right there and then, your Pokémon have no weakness. This means that you could use Mewtwo much more effectively against Caldeo. You could also use Landorus, which would do a nice lot of early damage, and would then be able to take out their Blastoise in one hit. However, Blastoise decks tend to play stadiums, they have to play Tropical Beach or their deck will suck. So the chances are they're going to have a counter stadium for your Plasma Frigate, so maybe it's not that great. I like the idea, it's not that great. So I'm going to finish off today having a quick look about cities and what's been winning so far. And quite frankly, the winningest deck, no surprise, Blastoise Caldeo. 36 wins, 23%. Almost one in every four cities in America has been won by Blastoise Caldeo. The next winning is deck, Landorus Mewtwo with 24 wins, Dark Rye Dragon with 13 wins. And this is where the list gets a little bit confusing. Now I took this list off Pokegym and thank you very much to all the people on Pokegym that have helped to compile this list. But they've got all these different kind of uh, Dark Rye decks all listed separately. Hammer Time and Darkrai Mewtwo and Darkrai Fighting. But if you put them all together, Darkrai gets 27 wins, more than Landorus Mewtwo. If you put Darkrai Hydreigon and Darkrai other decks together, that gives 40 wins, making it the winningest deck. Now, the thing that really strikes me about this list is that if you look at the other decks on there, Blastoise Caldeo should beat Landorus Mewtwo. And Blastoise Caldeo should beat Hammer Time. And Blastoise Caldeo should beat most other Darkrai decks. So actually, Blastoise Caldeo, as much as it's got the winningest deck, and it also beats things like Ho-Oh that have 12 wins, it beats a lot of the other winningest decks. So regionals are coming up in the US this coming weekend. I'll be here with all the news and gossip from regionals next weekend, including the controversial decision to keep the limit at top 32, despite some regionals last time getting 350 players meaning that 6-3, you ain't going to cut. You need to go 7-2 to cut. Ironically, making it harder to cut regionals than nationals. But anyway, I'm not going to go into that because that's going to be my one of my things I look at next week. Regionals is coming up, and the only deck for those American listeners, and I do have a fair few American listeners that get in touch. I always appreciate hearing from them. By the way, any American listeners I've do got, please get in touch with me and let me know how you did at regionals. 
the only deck I can recommend playing is Blastoise. I'm trying to work on Blastoise counter decks until I've tested them properly and gone to tournaments with them. I couldn't possibly recommend them. All I can really tell you is it's not an easy deck to counter. Play Blastoise Caldeo, prepare for the mirror, that is your best chance of doing well at regionals. And as we've reached about half an hour, I think that's about it. I've told you about my cities, I've told you about the cities winning us lists, and as always, I've gotten you nice and up to speed on all of the news coming around. As always, I'd love to hear from you, especially American listeners, like I've said, going to regionals, let me know what you played, how you did, etc. Especially if there's any PTCG radio listeners doing well in regionals in America, I want to hear from you, I want PTCG radio being represented. I'd love to go and play them myself, needless to say, it's not the most convenient. You can get in touch in all the usual ways. Find me on Twitter, at the Wassy. It is a private account, but add me. I'll accept you. I'm a nice chap. You can email me at ptcgradio at hotmail.co.uk. Or if you're listening on YouTube, get in touch through the comments on the bottom. As always, thank you very much for listening. Next week, I'll tell you all about regionals. My name's Ross, and you've been listening to PTCG Radio. <laughs>